Ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to be here. First, a few words to my title. I kind of like it. I think it is a clever way to allude to Hayek, the road to serfdom. Then for a few months, I had the, the two words freeway together, meaning the freeways that go through Silicon Valley. It's a place that is exclusively for cars. And then finally, I severed the two words, um, meaning the free where, the free software that I think is at the heart of this problem. I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, what was still known as the San Francisco Bay Area in 1983 with my family. <clears throat> it then turned into Silicon Valley, and I remember distinctly this advertisement during the Super Bowl halftime show. It cost one million dollars, and Apple was still a very small player. This small movie, directed by Ridley Scott, um, shows the defeat of personal computing over a monopoly that represented IBM. <clears throat> they were absolutely correct. It did not turn Orwellian. It was not Orwellian. We now know with hindsight that what happened was a total uh, collection of power, centralized power, um, but it does not come from the state. It comes from companies. And that makes me very scared. Um, I am surprised that not more people are upset. What I see happening is a total control of information um, in a very simple deal that we humans made. And the deal was simply convenience and comfort for liberty and freedom. And it happened right as we watched and it happened on the turf of libertarian ideology. These companies, I'm talking about big tech companies that have revenue more than many countries, larger than many countries, have received a free pass. And in the name of world events such as 9-11, the war on drugs and the war on terror, um, institutions such as the Patriot Act were passed and these companies, again, got a free pass. Google, for example, is very much um, intertwined with the government because, of course, such a vast database is any government's dream. <clears throat> this picture is a little bit uh, infantile, I have to admit, but it does show a lot of ho uh, things. It shows, for example, that behavior change is absolutely possible. In just a little over 10 years, with the launching of the smartphone, the tactile screen smartphone with Steve Jobs, humanity was changed forever. So behavior change is absolutely possible. It's not necessarily in the right direction, but it's absolutely possible. <clears throat> After World War II, there were several books written. Several authors tried to grapple with the question of what happened? How was this authoritarian atrocity possible? Hannah Arendt was one of them. And of course, George Orwell's 1984, written in 1949, another. 
And then there was the road to serfdom, another dire warning of what can happen if we let too much bureaucracy and socialism into the system. There was another book in 1948, uh, written more or less the same time as Orwell, by the founder of behavioral psychology, B.F. Skinner. And it's a novel. Walden II is a novel. Of course, it leans on Thoreau's uh, Walden I. Um, and it's a utopian tech novel. It is basically based on a society that through herding and nudging can be made into a harmonious society. In my opinion, it's an absolute nightmare. And in my opinion, this is the most realistic version. <clears throat> the San Francisco Bay Area is framed by two big towers. Um, and they are symbolic. So some of this story that I'm unfolding here is autobiographical. Um, my father was offered a job at the Hoover Institution. And of course, this is the Hoover Tower here. Hoover Institution is known for classical liberal um, thoughts and ideologies. And of course, Stanford has always had a very tight relationship with tech. It also is the place of the D school, the design school, and the persuasive technology lab that we will look at in more detail. Some alumni from here are the Google founders, for example. So while my parents mingled with more classical liberal circles, I moved to the People's Republic of Berkeley, which is what it's called because it's a very left-winged um, institution. And I loved it. I started practicing my sparring, and I started to um, really get a lot of leftish ideologies pumped into my head. <clears throat> Here are the two people that I mentioned earlier. Of course, most people are familiar with these two, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the founders of Google. They are Stanford alumni. And this guy, BJ Fogg, is the godfather of persuasive technology. This guy is a behavioral psychologist and, in my opinion, a complete traitor to the science of behaviorism. Um, we are talking about how to manipulate, herd, nudge people into doing what companies want them to. Meanwhile, I was studying cultural anthropology, and my department was still in the middle of affirmative action. Um, and a lot of the writing that I received next to the classical anthropologist was Marxian. I had to read Lenin. I read Noam Chomsky, um, and then there was a whole bunch of postmodernism, especially Michel Foucault. And I realize now how much this type of ideology leaked from public institutions like the University of Berkeley and other social science departments. And social science departments moved from social science to social activism. It is interesting to me that the San Francisco Bay Area, especially tech companies, have adopted this sort of ideology. Um, what, is, what was political correctness is now called wokeism, and it comes from an old phrase of African American vernacular to be woke, to be aware of discrimination and um, systemic racism. It is an interesting movement, and it's something that needs to be watched very closely. Like I said, it is very, very present in the creative sectors. This is something that I notice in design schools, where I work now, where I see a lot of people acting very left, but working in an extreme capitalist system of making new things all the time. Um, it is complete with orthodoxy. There are thought codes, there is dogma, there are certain books like White Fragility and others. Um, there are college campus speech codes, and there is absolutely the cancellation of heretics. And so it is appropriate to call this a new religion that is born right in front of our eyes. 
and it is deep inside of tech. This is just one strand. Some of you might have heard of the James the Moore um, incident or scandal. He wrote a memo called Google's Ideological Echo Chamber where he challenged, where he challenged the hiring policy and the diversity policy of, of uh, Google and was instantly fired. There are other people that follow this sort of example. High tech in the Bay Area is absolutely political and they make no, uh, they don't hide that in any way at all. What I'm talking about is tech utopianism. Um, social media has been celebrated as champions of open society and democracy. Um, and basically, once again, our deal has been convenience and comfort for privacy and for freedom. I think it's a horrible deal, personally speaking, but nobody seems to care. It seems to me that a lot of people will trade the comfort of sitting on our domesticated butts and listening to some silly Phil Collins song and ordering some vegan Uber Eats. I don't think that's a very good deal at all because all of that data on meta points is collected at all points during those transactions. I'll talk about that in more detail. Of course, artificial intelligence is involved, and a subcategory of, of artificial intelligence, machine learning. But we'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, Silicon Valley and tech utopianism is a very, very strange cocktail that it takes to untangle. Um, I don't think that many people are aware of this. There's a lot of libertarianism in the founding years of Silicon Valley's tech companies. There's Ayn Randism, which in my opinion, and I know I'm antagonizing some people now, is pure evil. Um, Ayn Randism, this idea of dogmatic e egoism, and individuality and anti-altruism. Skinnerian behaviorism, I've talked about that already, but the idea of conditioning and sanctioning of lab animals and later humans is obviously deep inside of this. Wokeism, tech utopianism I've already talked about, and hippie romanticism. The hippies of the San Francisco Bay Area turned into yuppies. Basically. <clears throat> so here's some of this stuff that I'm talking about. This was like the North Star for Steve Jobs and Peter Thiel and other, other investors and venture capitalists of the San Francisco Bay Area. This is kind of a Bible. I know from my anthropology studies this is absolutely not the way human beings are. Um, you find that funny. Um, I remember in the 90s, leading up to the millennium, I remember these large billboards with Mahatma Gandhi, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, um, John Lennon, and Nelson Mandela looking down from the freeway. There was a, 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 a strange sleight of hands where personal computing was equated with social justice. And um, it is something that I think we should look at very carefully. And then, of course, there is Steve Jobs, who is, again, a strange mixture of hippie-dom, LSD use, um, and randism. And, of course, he was a brilliant designer. There's no question about that. He made the machines pretty. In 2011, tech utopianism was probably at its highest, and I remember distinctly that over 10 years ago, everyone was celebrating social media, such as Facebook and Twitter, as a savior of technology. There were people who, in all honesty, said that it was social media that saved Egypt and that toppled authoritarianism. We obviously know that was not the case, 
Um, there's also Los Indignados of Spain at the same, in the same year. They, of course, also communicated using social media. And the Occupy Wall Street with their famous slogan of we are the 99%. <clears throat> As I grew up in the Bay Area, I noticed a kind of caste system that is happening, that is starting to take place. San Francisco Bay Area is notorious for its homelessness, and there's a gigantic, palpable, noticeable divide in wealth. This is Apple Park that was just opened in 2017, and next to it we have entire favelas, entire tent cities of people who cannot pay for a house. Of course, venture capitalists looked sideways. They were much more interested in the tech bubble, or what became the, the dot-com bubble. But what is far more intense and far more troublesome, in my opinion, is what I call an epistemological breakdown. So during the pandemic, I was concerned about many things that were happening. It seemed that humanity was losing its sense and becoming insane in front of our eyes. And I started saying, I don't think we have an epidemiological crisis. We, we did, but what occupied me much more, what is much more concerning to me, is an epistemological breakdown when we cannot agree anymore what is truth, what is fact, and what is. So there is an absolute neglect of all, um, of all journalism, of scientific institutions, etc. Free software is, of course, in, to a large degree, to blame. Algorithms and machine learning are two. I will explain that in a second. And then the cognitive biases that all us humans have, um, as well as targeted campaigning, where the democratic process is just the process of marketing. Let's talk about algorithms and machine learning. Algorithm is a word that comes from a Persian mathematician, and it's a clever way to put uh, tech nerds into the fine art of mathematics. And it also gives it this pristine sense of being beyond good and evil. But it's not. Algorithms are absolutely programmed to achieve something by a programmer. Let's look at this for a second. So what Facebook uses is an algorithm that is based on machine learning. It means the algorithm gets smarter as it uses us. So we are told certain things that are to be seen. And the algorithm decides our feed. It decides everything that we are looking at and want to look at. And of course, that starts to polarize our opinions of the world. <clears throat> 2007 and 2009, Apple released the like button, and who would have thought that this cute little thing becomes so powerful? There's the like button, and then there's the share button, and this is the retweet button of Twitter. Of course, this gives social media and this entire phenomenon of IT, the extra bonus of making things viral, of spreading exponentially. Here's a very simple little formula. Free will is smaller than free stuff. It's not as powerful. The way you should think about this is it is sort of like a novice chess player playing against Gary Kasparov. We get overwhelmed every single time we cannot look away from the things that are fed to us on social media. Let me remind everyone here that we're talking about a user base of 3 billion people. This is the largest social experiment that has ever been seen. 
here are some biases that we humans have and the idea of rational choice theory and us being rational actors is just wrong. It's just wrong. There are lots of things that we make mistakes with. This is stuff that made perfect sense in our archaic past and evolutionary history, but doesn't now. So what used to be a feature is now a bug. Confirmation bias. We like to think, we like to read only the books that reinstate our opinion. We like to see only the things that say, yes, you are correct. That is a bias. Saliency bias means that we like to look at the thing that is most crazy and most bright and most attention-getting. Negativity bias means that we remember and focus on negative things much easier than positive things. When we traveled here to this conference, you probably remember the single car crash or the single rude overtaking of a car, and you don't remember, conveniently, the hundreds of thousands of people who've passed you by peacefully. Subjectivity bias is that we are caught inside of our own bubble, and we tend to think that what is happening to our inner world is what's happening to the outer world. It's not. And in-group bias, of course, is a very strong one. I want you, everyone to, re to imagine right now to be part of an ideological camp or a church community or an athletic team. And now think of an alternative one. And now think of which one is better. I think my point was made, and you would say, oh, well, obviously the first one, that's why I'm in it. That's in-group bias. And the feeds of YouTube, of Google, and of Facebook, and of Twitter are based directly on those biases. They prey on them. They're engineered for them. <clears throat> So what happens is a kind of an echo chamber. This is a term that I find quite useful, where we only see the things that we want to see. So preying on all of these weaknesses of the human mind on purpose, obviously, you can see how this would lead to moral outrage, anti-journalism, because we get all the feeds, everything that, that we know is correct. Why would you read anything else? <clears throat> and here's where it gets really dangerous. I am extremely concerned with this kind of stuff, and I don't know why there is no, not more moral outrage. It is now an absolute fact that companies such as Cambridge Analytica, by the way, they were the only ones that got caught. Cambridge Analytica, an analytic and uh, statistical company, looks at data points, such as likes, tweets, little hearts, little comments, and then it combines it with the big five personality tests that are floating throughout the internet, and it can then predict who is sitting on the fence in a democratic election and who must be conveyed to go into one or the other direction. These kinds of data points are sold, to data brokers, and they in turn send messages that are either truthful or untruthful. We now know for a fact that that is what caused Brexit. And that is what got this orange gnome into the White House. It's very serious. And you have to remember, once this game starts getting played, it's a slippery slope, and anyone who does not use social media as a politician has no chance. Here are two nauseating examples that Facebook, now known as Meta, uh, got accused of. Um, hateful messages were sent and were exponentially resent, turned viral, and they caused in very real life on the streets true genocide. There are two examples in Myanmar, 
in, the South, in Southeast Asia and also in Ethiopia, where Facebook could not stop, could not filter the moral outrage that was going around its network, which is massive, and people were killed. Now, by the way, Apple has no, sorry, um, Facebook or Meta has, or Google with its YouTube, has no way of filtering everything. And I hate to say this to you, because it's really quite disturbing, but there are people in what we call sweat camps in the middle, in, in Southeast Asia, whose job is to watch all day long suicide clips, self-harm clips, snuff movies, etc., and say, you can't show that, you can't show that. It's real people that watch all of our trash every single day. I think that's a despicable thing that is allowed to be happening right in front of our eyes. Here are some more things that I will try to explain to you because maybe you were just thinking humanity is just losing the plot. And to a certain extent, you're true. There has been a gigantic spike of gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is the, is the concept of a small teenager, usually girls, thinking that they're in the wrong body. There has been a gigantic spike in girls going on their transition, which means, which means hormonal treatment and, in some cases, actual um, operations. In the state of California, you need to be 16 years old to transition. And while there are obviously people who are born as trans, the spike has been 500%. And it does correlate with what I've just said in the last few slides in terms of time. What about Black Lives Matter, where all of a sudden, during a airborne viral pandemic, also known as COVID, where all of a sudden, everyone was able to break their lockdown and was able to go to the streets and march against systemic racism. That was very strange and is absolutely explainable by knowing something about social media. QAnon. This is not a small little fringe organization. There are millions of people in this organization, and they have the craziest thoughts you have probably ever heard of before. QAnon believes that there's a cabal of deep state politicians, and they want to stay young forever, and so they cannibalize small babies and drink their blood. I am not making this up. And their leader, their chosen cult leader, is Donald J. Trump. I'm completely serious. There's hundreds of, uh, there's, there's millions of people who follow this kind of craziness. And once again, it is spread entirely by big tech. There's the famous Pizza Gate, where somebody took it so serious that they thought they're saving small children. They rushed into a pizza restaurant with an automatic rifle, um, ready to shoot some people. And of course, right in front of our eyes, there was an actual assault on one of the greatest democracies of this planet. January 6th, there was a mad run for the capital, and they almost, it was a coup attempt. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> Surveillance capitalism is what we can call this new phenomenon. It's kind of a new beast. And the way it works is that there's a gigantic database called behavioral big data, which is basically all of our touch points, all of our tracks as we go through the internet. Um, but not just our search queries. It is also the way we answer, and it is also our smart technology devices, our wearables, and it is also our Alexas, and it is also our Series, and any other digital assistant. Vast data sets on human behavior, action and interaction, 
that is collected in gigantic servers in the Utah desert and other places. Typical of Silicon Valley euthanism, this is called data exhaust. At first, all this data was collected and no one really cared for it. As a matter of fact, in the early days of big tech, um, people didn't know how to make money with their, with their freeway, and they decided against capitalizing directly on algorithms. Well, they found that there's a gold rush going on, and this data exhaust, um, the meta levels above our search queries are very valuable, valuable. And what is happening is prediction products made from behavioral surplus data are traded with brokers. So we say Michael Loewe is probably going to lose his attention span in such and such a way, and he will get distracted in such and such a way. Would you like to know about that? And of course, politicians and anyone who wants to sell you anything is very much into this type of information. <clears throat> I believe very strongly that if we let things run, the future will become a very dystopic place. I don't believe we can just let laissez-faire uh, run its course. I think the invisible hand is a wrong metaphor. I think it is outdated. We are not self-serving individual units. We absolutely have an altruistic side in us because we are the descendants of living groups, of surviving groups. Individuals don't have babies. Homo economicus is wrong, and if you tell people long enough that homo economicus is the way we are, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Here's the interesting point. These companies that I'm talking about have both freedom and total knowledge of market. And so it's simply not arguable to say we must give them a leeway for them to get to the best results. Big data creates its own market by manipulating us. So it's a whole new, it's a whole new monster. My solution space, just two more slides. I think it might make sense to treat them as utility companies. In utility companies such as water, electricity, or maybe the railway system, it sometimes doesn't make sense to artificially create competition and make a new uh, track or a new uh, water pipe, and so we accept them. But it does re involve regular inspections. It does involve unbundling the products, throwing up a paywall, which would solve a lot of different points, and capping profits by simulating uh, competition. Please get involved. I am very much um, in, not involved, informed. I'm very much scared about this. I recommend all of these books. I recommend this documentary. And this is probably one of the best books I've read ever. Um, in terms of control, we can remove toxic applications. We can turn off notifications and push um, um, beeps and things like this. <laughs> Follow voices that don't agree with you. Let's get out of our echo chambers and let's support journalism. And of course, more than anything else, get off social media immediately. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs>